What's going on everybody, Jen Min here with today's new comic book day reviews, it's Wednesday, August 4th, and as always, I'm going to go through this week's comics as spoiler free as possible, mostly no spoilers, pretty much no spoilers. Crazy thing happened to me, first of all, I've been picking up the DC books pretty early, my shop's been getting them on Saturdays, so I read all the DC titles on Sunday, hopefully I can retain what I read. But then today, Tuesday, is when I'm filming this, I got the text that the diamond shipment didn't arrive. So I had to scramble to try to get the Marvel books and some of the indies uh, that are not image. Like, I don't get image Skybound, but I get image PDFs. Anyway, shout out to that special someone who got me the Marvel PDFs. I really appreciate it. He will go unnamed. But uh, there's a couple of books that I didn't get to read that were on my poll. I didn't get Firepower 14, I didn't get Out of Body 3, and I didn't get Lucky Devil 1, but I read everything else that I plan to read, so we're going to jump into this. Make sure that you're subscribed to the channel, hit the notification bell so you don't miss a video. If you guys aren't aware, we're doing a giveaway once we hit our next subscriber milestone of 150k, and we're giving away the Deja Thoris Premium Format by Sideshow. If you stick around to the end of the video, I'll give you details on how the giveaway will work. So with that out of the way, let's jump into the reviews and let's start with Marvel. These are the books that I just read, so they're the most fresh on my mind and hopefully will get me in the groove when I start looking at the other books. So let's start with Hellions, issue 14. This is by Wells, Antonio, and Burrito. So Hellions is the Mr. Sinister-led team, and I think this issue shined a lot of light on what happened during the last issue, and I know I was a little bit confused because it tied into what happened during 10 of swords what did the hellions do where were they tasked to go to try to prevent the tournament from happening so that came full circle last issue and i think it really explained it better especially in the opening synopsis but also during the storytelling here on why they're in the predicament that they're in and they're battling these foes from this place i forget the name of it pretty cool to see sinister's plans kind of blow up in his face but mr sinister is never really god he's got backup plans he's like batman and i love to see him enact that plan and <laughs> just very sinister like you know why he's mr sinister here he does some evil stuff he's always like throwing somebody under the bus or leaving somebody behind he's just the most selfish most self-absorbed marvel villain i think maybe him and dr doom but i enjoyed hellions 14 i thought it was fun i, th I thought it was cool to see the hellions uh the realization that uh what he did to them during uh ten of swords see i told you mostly spoiler free next up we have spirits of vengeance spirit rider issue one or i don't know if this is a one shot or what it is uh quite a few creators here you got taboo b earl davidson uh Varege, and brown so I'm kind of torn on this. Like, there were some things I liked about this issue and some that I hated. So first of all, this spirit rider, this demon rider character, I'm not really familiar with her. I know she became Sorcerer Supreme in one of the recent Doctor Strange runs. But she's tasked with helping Johnny Blaze get the evil out of him. Because if you guys were reading Ghost Rider along with me, which was a run I really liked, I think it was Chris Cantwell, uh, he was the Mephisto. He was the ruler of hell, and it just kind of ate at his soul, and he became evil. So she's basically trying to exercise those demons. Those scenes are cool. Going to his memories, trying to pull out or the bad memories or save the good memories, save the innocence, you know, things of that nature was cool. I thought the opening dialogue when you met her with her friends at the coffee shop was super cringe. It just felt so unrealistic. Hated that scene. And then towards the end, it kind of lost me here, but... I was happy to see what's going on with Johnny Blaze. Like, this is definitely a continuation of him from that story. So, if you're really wanting to follow the Johnny Blaze saga, you're going to want to read this. But, yeah, it had some ups and downs. On to X-Men 2, Jerry Dugan, along with La Raz and Garcia. So, I definitely like this. This is continuing the new X-Men team in New York City in their treehouse. We kind of see who is attacking Earth, this uh, gamer world. It kind of reminded me of Mojoverse, but it's like a casino orbiting a black sun, sending um, basically uh, something that will hatch and become uh, an Annihilation Wave, which was a super dope callback. I love the Annihilation storyline. Big champion of them adapting that into the MCU. So that was a pretty cool scene. It's kind of like reintroducing the X-Men into New York City, into the Marvel 616. You have cameos from people from Fantastic Four and things like that in the beginning here. So I, I really did like it. It shined a little light on Sunfire here, which was pretty well-deserved, but a, an amazing battle and really showcasing them as a team, using teamwork to uh, overcome these bugs from the annihilation wave so super dope artwork was great 
Uh, fun, fun series so far. Then we have Immortal Hulk issue forty nine. Al Ewing. He's joined with Bennett, Jose, uh, Barbo, and Mounts. So this was a very unique uh, way of storytelling. So it was basically these black bars, like on the left or on the right or maybe at the bottom, with dialogue. It's uh, with dialogue. It's this narration. I forget who's walking with Hulk and She-Hulk, but this regular human-looking person narrating what's happening. Hulk walking into Avengers Mansion, basically owning up to everything that's been happening so far. And uh, the storytelling was good. I liked the narration. The artwork was great. Kind of a different way of, of storytelling, especially for this series so far. So pretty cool, as you can see from the cover here, which all done by Alex Ross were amazing. Um, this kind of final frontier that Hulk's going on, which is going to lead to the last issue. So... Interesting to see how it ends. Marvel, you know what to do. It's time for an omnibus for the 50 issues of Hulk plus the one-shots. Man, you might have to make two volumes. Then we got Sinister War, issue number two. Spencer, Breeson, Bagley, Nuevis, Gomez, and Reber. You know, every time Spencer does it to me. I liked Sinister War, issue one. I liked Amazing Spider-Man. What was it, 73 or something, 74? I didn't really like Sinister War, issue two. As you can see from the cover, that's what you're getting. Uh... A melee of all these different Sinister Six teams. They're all put together, but what we do uncover in this issue is why they're put together. Who's controlling them? I mean, it's as plain as day. I mean, we know who's... I'm not going to spoil it, but obviously, if you're following this run for 100 issues or whatever, you already know who's behind it all. Uh, but, you know, it, it was very 90s maximum carnage without the symbiotes. Just every Spider-Man villain you could think of crammed in these teams and, and all trying to kill Spider-Man at once. So I thought some of the dialogue was weak. Like, I really hate it when, like, villains call Taskmaster Tasky. Like, I, I get when Spider-Man says it. That makes a lot of sense. But I don't know. You had, like, a little superior foe, foes of Spider-Man kind of um, reunion here and such. I don't know. It was big, dumb fun, which I usually like. But I just really wasn't digging it this time. Last one from Marvel, Lasher. I loved Lasher. Man, if you guys are reading Extreme Carnage, this is part, what, four of eight, is it? You guys know how excellent of an issue was. This is going to make my top ten. I'm not sure where I'm going to put it yet, but Chapman, Moneyham, uh, or is it Mooneyham? <laughs> Moneyham is a good nickname. Uh, Beirut, Menes, and Campbell. So we got Phage. We got Scream. We got the Alpha. This is the Lasher issue. And they're really doing a great job of showcasing the individuality of these Life Foundation symbiotes. Like, I couldn't explain to you Lasher or Phage or, I know, Agony's coming up and, and Riot and all that. But you get a good idea how different the symbiotes are. Some have hosts. Some take temporary hosts. Uh, some didn't have a host and they inhabit this very old man from a nursing home. So crazy. So graphic. So gory. Uh, we get a, a first appearance, kind of, here. We get a new symbiote in this issue. Not going to spoil it. I'm digging it. I like where they went with it. It makes a lot of sense. Tying it into Agent Anti-Venom. Tying it into uh, the events from the Phage miniseries. That whole, did that person really die thing? All uncovered in here or uh, expounded upon more. Love the artwork. Love the gruesomeness to it. I'm loving Extreme Carnage. All right, so let's jump into Image. We have The Me You Love in the Dark. Uh, this was one that I just happened to see. I get the Image PDFs. You know, when there's a new number one, I'll I'll scan through it. And if it looks interesting, I'll read it, which is how I missed out on Stray Dogs. So you can't always judge a book by the interior. Anyway, this is written by Scott Young. He's joined uh, by George Corona, Gene Francis. How do you pronounce this? Uh, Beilu and Nate Pico. So this was kind of like... A Casper type of story like you see this house on the cover the woman on the front is this artist and she's already kind of made it but she is having like what's artist block is is that is that a thing is there a writer's block and artist block I guess so she's trying to find inspiration so she's renting out like this house that's supposedly haunted and yeah it is haunted so love I love it I thought it was really interesting it, it really makes for a good movie or TV show you know uh, Scotty Young dipping his toes into the writing he's been doing it because he did it with what Strange Academy uh, he's doing it here he's written other stuff as well but uh, I thought it had great playful dialogue it wasn't a horror book but it wasn't too you know childlike or kiddish I thought it was like right in that in that good middle ground there for interesting fun kind of cute kind of quirky uh kind of scary at times some of the artwork so yeah i was digging this one then we got stillwater issue nine the man ships the darsky with roman k perez and mike spicer this was creepy so you have this baby on here so like what if a baby was born 
in still water where you can't age. Does its mind age, but it's trapped into the, in this little baby body? Interesting stuff. Picking a lot up from where we left off in the last issue with the former sheriff and you know going through her backstory and her turning her back on the mayor and 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 our main character, the son. He would have been this baby. I don't. He, I think he was a little bit older though. But he went out. He lived his life and came back. He's idolized by the children of Stillwater. Uh, there's all kind of chaos and confusion going on in this city. Super fun issue. I thought it was well paced. There was great action to it. The artwork in this series has been great since the start. And I love the mythologies that they're building within this with this town. Like exploring all the what ifs that would happen if this really happened in real life. All right, then we have Geiger issue five. This is by Jeff Johns, Gary Frank, and Brad Anderson. You gotta love Geiger. Geiger with the two kids. Uh, last we we left, uh, they were captured by the bad guys. So what happens when you capture Geiger and you start poking and prodding around? Probably not going to have a good time. So um, they're trying to figure out, are the kids infected? They've been out. They've been breathing the radioactive air. One kid is fine. One kid might not be. What happens? What do they do in Las Vegas to uh, prevent infection and spread? A lot of eerie, creepily, eerily similarities to what's going on in the real world. Hopefully we don't get to this level. But great artwork. I mean, uh, the glowing man, uh, his strength, his powers, his abilities, what he's able to do. And he's got a soft spot for these kids. I mean, we know that he was guarding uh, his family, right? And, 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 and for decades, and it was all for what, right? So it makes sense why he's got this connection. He's got to save them. He may not have been able to save his family. So uh, he's got to save these kids. And then jumping over to Boom Studios real quick, I did get a hold of Basilisk, issue number three, Cullen Bunn, Jonas Scharf, Alex Gumaris. Issue three, by far the strongest issue of the series so far. I can't wait to talk about this with Robbie because I think this nailed everything. It kind of lacked in the first issue, picked up in the second issue, expounded on in this issue. So well paced, going between both parties, the, the people with the powers who last we saw them killed everybody in that diner after their little meeting and uh, reconciliation, reconciliation. And then the girl who's kidnapped one of these god, I forget what they even call them, uh, and we get her motivation. Why is she so hell-bent on killing these guys? What happened to her in her past? So I thought the way that they handled that and explained that was really touching and it made a lot of sense. Uh, and yeah, you you just love how ruthless these people with powers are. It reminds me of one of those movies where you have outlaws and they're on the run and they go to this pit stop to get something to eat, but the cops find them. So then there's a big shootout out front. Like that's kind of what happened here. But imagine bad people with superpowers. So Dang, definitely love Basculus. I like the art style too. I like how sometimes in the beginning it'll give you some scenes with no dialogue. Just get setting the tone and the atmosphere. Like, I'm not trying to say like I don't like comics with dialogue, but I mean it doesn't have to be exposition, exposition right off the bat. Like ease us into it, kind of paint the picture, set the scenario, and then boom, hit us with everything. So I think Cullen did an amazing job with the team here on making that happen in this issue. Before we jump into the DC books, a quick word from our sponsor. Cheap Graphic Novels is your online home for brand new graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They pride themselves on packaging your books so they arrive safely and in excellent condition, as well as prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain bin for even greater deals up to 90% off cover price. CGN is excited to announce that they're now taking pre-orders. They're making it easier for you to ensure that you don't miss out on the hottest releases. Cheap Graphic novels is currently running a special promotion for the Geminites. If you're a first-time customer, let them know that you were referred by Gem Mint Collectibles at checkout and you'll receive a credit for free shipping on your next order. This promotion is only valid for the United States. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discounts and quality shipping and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. So, the Suicide Squad Get Joker, that kind of reminded me of like Get Shorty or something like that, is a DC Black Label oversized magazine cover. This is by Azarello, Maliv, and Hollingsworth. So let me tell you something about this book. It feels like a classic story, even though it's a brand new issue. Like the art style feels like this is going to be in a collected edition someday. Loved it. This is basically Jason Todd telling his origin story, how he was this kid, uh, how he ended up becoming Robin, how he felt as Robin, how he was killed by Joker, and he's in jail because he was caught for being a vigilante, for killing people and whatnot. So he gets approached by Amanda Waller to join the Suicide Squad 
to get Joker. If you could take down Joker, we'll shave time off your sentence. You know the whole Amanda Waller spiel by now. He's joined by Harley Quinn. He's joined by other members of the Suicide Squad. This panel on the back of the book is actually pretty important. I loved it. A Jason Todd-led Suicide Squad out to get the Joker. Sign me up. I'm in. It's fun. It feels like a classic in the making. The other big Joker book here, Joker, a puzzle box. The Joker presents a puzzle box. This is by Rosenberg, Marino, Hickson, Ariola, and this is issue one. Everyone's talking about this. And yeah, I think it was fun. So this is like, it feels like Batman the Animated Series, but like with updated artwork. Like all the characters kind of look like how they looked in the animated series, but it's more realistic. It reminds me of like late 80s, early 90s Batman art, art style to it. Joker here is basically being interrogated by Commissioner Gordon. He had this big house party with every villain, all of the Batman rogues gallery. It gets busted up by Batman. Everybody gets arrested. Joker says, I'll talk while he's in the cell with everybody. And, and he goes to talk to Gordon. And, and of course, all the rogues are like, you snitch, you rat, you this, you that. Uh, but when he's with Gordon, the way he's describing the events, it's like his version of what happened. So the dialogue that he gives Batman and he gives everyone that was there, it's in Joker's sick, twisted sense, in, in a humorous way. Uh, there's a there's a murder here. One of the rogues gallery uh, members has been murdered, so they're really trying to figure out who killed them. Uh, it was interesting. I'm, I'm definitely excited to see where this goes. So yeah, I think uh, Puzzle Bucks was a hit. Another one for Black Label, we have The Conjuring, The Lover. This is issue three of five, and it's two stories like all the other issues have been. The main story is this girl in college. She's like hearing voices. She's getting possessed. Something is always in the shadows or around the corner. She's scared. She wants to go home. She can't quite make it. You know, she almost killed her roommate in the last issue. She seemingly killed somebody in this issue. It's horror. The art style is gritty and creepy and... You don't want to read it in the dark, basically. The backup story has to do do with this little uh, monkey toy. It's this baby that was born that's like a walking calamity. And every time the monkey's around, and it makes, it makes noise when it knows something bad's going to happen. So it's really like the baby seems to be supernatural, and the monkey seems to be supernatural. And it just shows as it's growing all these different events and bad things that are happening around it. Creepy little story. It's kind of like a Simpsons Treehouse of Horror type of story, but like really scary. Then we got Crush and Lobo, issue three of eight. This is by Tamaki, Nahulpin, and Von Villain. This was also the best one out of the series so far. So we know that Crush is on her way to see her father Lobo. He's locked up, and Lobo, he shows why he's a piece of shit in this issue. <laughs> so I like seeing Lobo again. I love the art style here. I think Tamaki's writing is really refreshing and fun. She gets the character. She knows how to change her style almost. From detective comics to this, it's like it feels like two different writers in a good way, though. She really adapts and narr narrates this through uh, the voice of Crush. So uh, really well done. The artwork is good. Less about the Crush relationship. Like, okay, we get it. But it's like enough of that. Like, we wanted to see what happened with her and Lobo, and that's what happens here. And it sets up fun stuff to come. Moving on over to Crime Syndicate issue six of six. Thank you. I liked it when it started, but I was ready for this to be over. Schmidt, McCohen, Hitch, Vines, O'Leaf, and Sinclair. Justice has no home on Earth 3. I don't know what the hell was going on in this, man. Everybody's fighting each other. I'm not really sure who's on whose side. I don't know what's going on with the Green Lantern. What is his name? The Emerald Knight? I don't know. Is he good or bad? I can't really tell. And I don't want to get confused with other stuff that I'm reading, but was this the formation of the Injustice League or whatever? I don't know. I was kind of lost in this issue. Too many characters I know nothing about. Glad it's over. We're done. Then we're on over to Suicide Squad with issue six. This is by Thompson Soy, P uh, Pansica, Ferreira, and Sinclair. So this one was dope. So Bloodsport, we know he was sent over to Earth 3 by Amanda Waller to uh, look for metahumans, and they find Ultraman. So this is basically... Suicide Squad dealing with Ultraman on Earth-3. Um, a lot of revelations for the clone Superboy, John Connor, is it? I think it's John Connor. I mean, that's Terminator, but is it Jonathan Kent? It's not Jonathan Kent. I think it's Jonathan Connor. Anyway, and a surprise visit at the end here. So that's kind of like the hook setting up the next arc, I guess, on the 
Kryptonian that shows up at the end. It makes sense if you think about it. So it was fun. I like Ultraman. Crime Syndicate, you know, if it was just Ultraman, I would be cool with that. Seeing Ultraman here just ripping through these guys was, was a fun read for sure. All right, then we have uh, Justice League issue 66 by Bendis, Hester, Gapster, and Mulvihill. Justice ends the United Rise. Sorry, guys. So, yeah, you have a destroyed Justice League. We have this super all-powerful character. Uh, his name is Sinmar. And everybody's fighting him. I don't know. I wasn't really digging it. The art style has, like, a very blocky, almost Ed McGinnis style, like, with the thick lines, but more blocky and jaggedness to it. Um, I, I'm not really digging this all-powerful Sinmar. I don't even remember the origins of what happened here. Like, what happened to the whole Naomi's homeworld? Did this Sinmar come from there? I don't even remember. Kind of losing interest in Justice League. Then we got the Swamp Thing, issue 6 out of 10 with Rom V, Perkins, and Spicer. Amazing issue. The art style was incredible. The coloring was incredible. I love, like... The violets and the and the greens and, and and just the imagery of the swamp. Suicide Squad sent to try to capture Swamp Thing was amazing. Our new Swamp Thing learning the green, speaking with important people in his life through the green, whether they're memories or visiting them in the green. It was trippy. It's Alan Moore inspired, in my opinion, which is a good thing. And I, I thought it was just a fun, great issue. It's funny seeing the Suicide Squad from the other perspective, like. You know, we're watching them kind of getting picked off from Swamp Thing's perspective rather than from their own. So, great issue. All right, guys, next up we have Batman issue 111. This is by Tiny and Jimenez and Mori. Great issue. Amazing artwork in here. We finally see this Scarecrow emerge. What is his actual plan? How does this lead into this whole Fear State arc? Well, it happens in here. Absolutely loved his interaction with the Peacekeeper 01. Why is the Peacekeeper so insane? Well, maybe it's something to do with what happens in this issue. Maybe he already was a little bit unhinged and this just drove him over the edge. Uh, the interactions with Scarecrow, very uh, Arkham Origins. Was that the video game that he was in or was it Arkham Asylum? I thought that was fun. I thought it was funny. Like, what was it? Batman. Was that this issue? Batman, Robin, and Harley Quinn? Or who was it? And Harley Quinn saying she's part of the Bat family because she had a bat with her. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, the Ghost Maker backup wasn't as strong as the last one, but it wrapped up nicely. It's, again, showing you why he should be respected as a character, being told through other characters who have fought him and things of that nature. So... Yeah, Batman continuing to be a strong title. All right, guys, and my pick of the week. It was a close one. I almost wanted to give it to Suicide Squad Get Joker. I think that's still a strong contender, but I had to go with The Nice House on the Lake, Issue 3, James Tiny in the Forest, Alvaro, Martinez, Bueno, and Jordi Belair. I'm just so interested in this story. This one is playing with the um, thought of, what if everybody's not on board with just chilling in the house while the apocalypse happens on, in the world outside? Some people, it's not going to sit right with them. And this guy, it all follows one of them. I'm not really sure who he is. I don't think it matters. But he's checking the perimeter. He's trying to figure out uh, like a topographical map. Is that the right way to say that? Uh, and he's finding all these kind of weird, like, um structural designs and another little house presumably where walter lives and it's not like that one structure where if you touch it you can see your home in real time these ones don't seem to have an effect to the touch but maybe it has an effect to like the biosphere that they're in or whatever so super interesting stuff i want to see what happens i'm so excited to continue to read this and, and see how it unfolds uh tiny and playing with um you know, different people and, and how they would react in this situation. So that's kind of the vibes here. A lot of creepy panels of Walter doing that face morph three heads kind of thing. Still trying to figure out what the hell he is. Great artwork here. It's a page turner. It keeps you wanting to read more and find out what happens. So pick of the week, nice house on the lake issue three. But let me know what your guys' favorite book was in the comment down below, whether it's your pick of the week or your top five or what have you. That's what's going to enter you into the giveaway because we're giving away the Deja Star Wars Premium format once we hit 150,000 subscribers. When we hit the milestone, we'll go live the following Sunday, pick a random video where I promoted the giveaway, and use a random YouTube comment generator to draw a worldwide winner. So you're going to want to comment on as many videos as possible. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate it as always, but don't go anywhere. Make sure to check out last week's new comic book day reviews. There were a ton of great books, plus an advanced review of Primordial by Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino. Check out last week's top 10 favorite comics of the week with Rock and Robbie and stay minty fresh. Peace.